Boa tarde. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about omic heating, which is one of the main topics I've been, I've been conducting research in the last years. So my name is Giovanna Domeneghini Mercalli. I am a professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in the Institute of Food Science and Technology. So omic heating is a ter uh, it's an electrical technology and one topic that is under debate is what, whether or not the electric field has an underlying non-thermal effect that enhances the inactivation of microorganisms and enzymes. So we will talk about it today. So this presentation is going to focus, uh, is going to start with a brief introduction. Uh, and after that, I'm going to talk about the effects of this technology on microorganism and enzyme inactivation. Uh, and later, the effects of this technology on nutritional and bioactive compounds. And I will end with final considerations. So let's get down to it with one question, right? So how particulate and heat sensitive foods can be blanched, pasteurized or sterilized? Strawberries. For example, um, strawberries uh, in strawberry syrup or strawberry pulp with uh, pieces of fruit on it. How can we blanch or pasteurize a product like this? What do you think? Maybe we can use a plate heat exchanger or a shell and tube heat exchanger. I scraped surface heat exchanger, maybe better. What do you think? I believe that all of them may produce something like this. And the reason is because the thermal treatments are based on heat transfer. So we have conduction and convection mechanisms of heat transfer. So when we have particulate foods or uh, viscose products, we need to wait the heat to be transferred to the coldest point of the product. And while the heat is being transferred, uh, we may have overheating of the surfaces. If we have, for example, uh, a sample with two phases, liquid and solid, probably the liquid phase is going to be overheated until the solid phase is, uh, is at the um, temperature of the process. So this is a very uh, important drawback of the, the convention technology. And what I ask, uh, I ask you is how can we uh, process this kind of product without compromising uh, nutritional and sensory attributes? So one way is using ohmic heating. Ohmic heating is a fast and uniform heating depending on the circumstance, right? And we are going to talk about it. So what is ohmic heating? Ohmic heating consists of using electrodes to pass an alternating current, electric current through a conductive medium, in this case, food, right? And increasing its temperature by the Joule effect. So the ohmic heating is also known as Joule, Joule heating or electroconductive heating and also electroheating. So the food will work as a resistance through which the alternating electric current passes. And then it's going to be a conversion of electrical energy into heat. To work, the sample needs to be placed between two electrodes and the samples need to be in contact with this electrode. The electrodes, um, the voltage is going to be applied in the electrodes and then the food that has ionic constituents will conduct electricity. In a microscopic level, um, what we can, we can describe as ions that are going to move because they are going to try to align themselves to the uh, oscillating electric field. And during this movement, the ions are going to ch shock with other molecules, are going to generate, generate friction. And these events are going to convert the electrical energy into thermal energy and thus increasing the temperature inside the food. 
So here uh, I bring a, a picture of the equipment that we have in our laboratory. It's a bench scale equipment. And uh, we can see the main parts of the equipment here. We have the cell, which is a, a Pyrex glass. Uh, in this cell, we have the electrodes. Uh, the electrodes are connected to a power supply. And this power supply is connected to a um, data system uh, collection data, which is linked to, to a computer. We have also uh, temperature sensors, uh, agitation of the sample, and some water bath to cool or to, um, to decrease the heating heat of the system. So here I bring some advantages and disadvantages of the technology. Ohmic heating has uh, the main advantage of this technology is the high heating rates, which we will talk more later. We also have the advantage of having a uniform heating of solid and liquid phases, especially if the solid and the liquid phases uh, have the same electrical conductivity. Because this process is independent of the thermal conductivity of the materials. It, it depends on the electrical conductivity of the materials. We can use high temperatures and short processing times, such as HTST and UHT. It's a simple and easy to use technology. So this equipment was built by me and a colleague. Um, of course, we had to study a lot to build it, but I mean, it's not something uh, really difficult to do it. Uh, we have the ability to start and stop thermal processing instant instantly, like in seconds. And it has a high energy efficiency. Dep depending on the product and the um, equipment design, we can convert up to 9% of electrical into thermal energy. Of course, this technology has also disadvantages. One of them is the high capital costs. It's still very expensive to buy uh, ohmic heating equipments. Uh, we may have uneven heating on the surface of the electrodes, especially with dairy products when we have foaling. And we can also have electrode corrosion. This may happen when we use um, non-inert materials to, to build the electrodes. So we cannot use, for example, stainless steel. We need to use uh, platinum, titanium, uh, this kind of material that uh, uh, are more inert. And if electrode, electrode corrosion happens, then we can contaminate our product by the metal constituents of the electrode. So one way to avoid electrode corrosion is to use appropriate material for electrodes and also high electric fuel frequencies. Then we are going to avoid electrochemical reactions that may happen during this process. So here, a little bit more about the heating heights of the ohmic heating. In this uh, picture, we have ohmic and conventional heating being compared. So in the y-axis, we have cooking time to boil in minutes. And in the x-axis, we have several uh, food products. So what we can see is that for several products, ohmic heating takes much less time to, to cook right? In some cases, less than twice the time of the, the conventional heating. So this is a great advantage of ohmic heating. We, we can cook foods faster. And then when we think about a pasteurization or a, a sterilization process, we can have process with shorter uh, times. Here in this graphic, we have the three main stages of a pasteurization or a sterilization process, the come up period, the holding time, and the cooling stage. So with the ohmic heating, we can short, we can become, the come up period here can become shorter. We can decrease the time for the temperature to reach the holding temperature. And with this, we have a shorter process. And with a shorter process, we have more nutrient re retention, right? And um, the organoleptic characteristics are maintained, right? Wow. Um, so let's dive into the effects of this technology on microorganism and enzyme inactivation. 
in the past, in the 80s and in the 90s, the academia believed that uh, microorganisms are inactivated, were inactivated only due to the temperature effect. So they believed that D values of ohmic heating were equal to D values of the conventional heating. But this started changing when some types of experiments were conducted. So the academia started to compare the ohmic technology with, with the conventional technology uh, using uh, the same temperature profile. So they treated samples by ohmic and conventional heating and samples had the same time temperature history. This is done to, to be able to infer the non-thermal effects of, this, of the technology because any difference between samples would be due to extra or non-thermal effects of the ohmic heating technology. So here it's one example. This experiment was conducted by a research group here at the Ohio State University. They evaluated the inactivation of bacillus coagulans spores under ohmic and conventional heating at 95 degrees Celsius. And what we see here in this picture is that né, we have here in the way axis the number of microorganisms uh, in a log scale against time. And in these uh, curves, we see that we see that ohmic heating took less time to inactivate the, the same numbers of microorganisms than the conventional heating. Because if we get the slope of this curve right, we uh, we can get the d values. So the d value for ohmic heating was lower than the d value of the conventional heating. So this means that I need less time to inactivate 9% of the microorganisms present uh, in a shorter time with uh, ohmic heating when compared to the conventional heating. Here it's another example. This study were performed in our research group. We, inactive, uh, we evaluated E. coli inactivation kinetics in artificially contaminated milk. So here we have the curve, the number of microorganisms in a log scale against time. And what we see here comparing both technologies is that ohmic heating was able to inactivate faster, um, a, um, a greater number of microorganisms if we take the same time here, for example, five minutes, right? So with time and with a lot of exp experiments being performed, there was, we end up with a conclusion that uh, ohmic heating has a thermal effect, that it's the main effect for a microorganism inactivation, but there are some extra non-thermal effects that enhance microorganism inactivation. These non-thermal effects are electroporation, cell permeabilization, and vibration of polar molecules. I will talk a little bit more about electroporation which is the main non-thermal effect. So we have the cell membranes of microorganisms and uh, vegetable cells, right? And this uh, membrane is composed of two layers of phospholipids with protein molecules embedded, embedded in these layers, right? So we have these two layers of phospholipids and this membrane separates the external from the internal medium in a cell, right? And in this membrane, there is a natural transmembrane potential that happens because the intracellular medium and the extracellular medium has had have ions that uh, accumulate here in the, in the membrane. So this natural transme transmembrane maintains the equilibrium of the membrane. But when we apply an electric field, this um, tr this transmembrane potential, it's high. So we have accumulation of charges in the membrane, in one side positive charges, in the other side negative charges. And when we exceed a critical value, the cell membrane is altered. There is a compression force that leads to poor formation. We can have uh, irreversible for, power formation or reversible power formation. 
and we can have also just changes in permeability. So when we apply ohmic heating, these pores are formed. Usually we have reversible pore formation with the range of electric fields applied in ohmic heating. So here it's an example of, uh, it's a picture that shows uh, how these pores are formed. There are um, rearrangement of the lipids in the membrane. And then we have these holes that are formed. These holes increase permeability, increase diffusion of material from inside to outside or from outside to inside. And we can also have cell lysis with leakage of int intracellular material to the external medium. So in this picture, I like it a lot because we can see very clear the effect of electroporation. We have a transmission electron microscopy of E. coli cells. So in the, the first one here, we have the intact cells. In the medium, the cells after conventional heating, 60 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds. And here in the bottom, we have the cells treated with ohmic heating using the same temperature and time, 60 degrees Celsius and 30 seconds. So here in the medium, we can see the effect of the temperature. You, we can see the, the cells are um, with a modified structure. The membrane is not more well-defined, right? But here in the bottom, we can see that the, the material inside the cell was leakage, was outside of the cell. So we can see the pores that are formed and allow cell leakage and in this case, uh, microbial death. So the, the, the majority of the, the, the experiments conducted so far, when done properly, when comparing uh, uh, treatments with the same temperature profile, were able to show us that we have these non-thermal effects that enhance Cell, uh, microbial inactivation. Knowing this, we started to, to, to evaluate these non-thermal effects on enzyme inactivation. So here there is an example. This is, was a study performed by our research group. We evaluated the POD residual activity of pumpkin, in pumpkin during conventional and omic blanching. So here in this picture, we have in the way axis, the residual activity against time. The, the empty symbols are the conventional treatment and the um, filled symbols are the omic treatment. So for a 90% 90, 90 reduction of the initial activity of the POD, it was required 1.5 minutes with omic blanching while, it, while we needed 2.5 minutes to achieve the same degree of inactivation with the conventional heating. So here we can see very easily that there are something different occurring in omic heating that allows a faster inactivation. Here it's another example. This study was also conducted by, by, our, by, by our research group. We evaluated POD residual activity over time in sugarcane juice during, during omic and conventional heating. So here we have several temperatures, 60, 70, 75, and 80 degrees Celsius. And what we see here, when we use the lowest temperature, 60 degrees, 60 degrees Celsius, we, can, we saw an activation of the, enzyme, of the enzyme. So here we can see this activation behavior. And in the highest temperature, 80 degrees Celsius, we could see an inactivation effect, an extra inactivation, especially here in the fourth, uh, first minutes of the heating. So here we also see that something is different when we apply ohmic heating. So after several experiments in the literature, we now understand that the oscillating electric field induces molecular motion and frictional energy dissipation. So these phenomena interfere in the tertiary and the quaternary structure of the enzymes 
and causes disruption or rearrangements of non-covalent bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and ionic bonds. And this disruption and rearrangements of bonds will um, enhance the inactivation rates of the enzymes. So, does the presence of the electric field affect the degradation of biocompounds in foods? We tried to answer this question. We performed several experiments to evaluate if electrochemical reactions and molecule polarization, these two phenomena may influence the way the molecules react when uh, heated biomic heating. To do that, we conducted experiments with the same temperature profile, right? Conventional anomic heating, comparing both technologies, and we evaluated differences in degradation rates. So we were interested in evaluating electrochemical reactions, such as electrode corrosion, because as I, I, to, as, as I told you at the beginning, right, um, if we don't use inert materials and depending on the conditions of the processing parameters, we may have electrode corrosion and the metals of the electrode can be released in the medium, catalyzing the degradation of bioactive compounds. We also can have a water, electro, a water electrolysis, and uh, this will produce free radicals that also may compromise bioactive compounds. The polarization phenomena um, may, is another phenomenon that is involved when we have polar molecules such as water, uh, the dipoles and the, the polar molecules, they rotate trying to align themselves to the electric field in a phenomenon known as orientation polarization. And even the non-polar molecules may have charges being shifted away or close to the nucleus, depending on, on the, the, the alternating electric current. So the idea was to evaluate if this phenomena could influence bioactive compounds degradation. So as I told you, uh, we performed experiments with similar temperature profiles, ohmic and conventional heating for several kinds of bioactive compounds. Here we have the results for anthocyanins. We evaluated the kinetic degradations. So here in, in, I, in the y-axis, we have the degradation kinetics against time, right? For two temperatures in this picture. And here in this table, we have the, the degradation rates for set four temperatures. And when we compare uh, temperature uh, during ohmic and conventional heating, excuse me, sorry, uh, we see that we have the same uh, degradation rates for all temperatures, meaning that we didn't have extra degradation regarding uh, the application due to the application of the ohmic heating. We uh, performed the same experiment for vitamin C. So here we have the results, the kinetic parameters under ohmic and conventional heating. Uh, and also here we can see that for from 80 to 95 degrees Celsius, there was no difference between the kinetic parameters of the ohmic and the conventional heating, showing that we didn't have extra non-thermal effects on uh, impacting the degradation of vitamin C. In this other experiment, we evaluated different frequencies. So we uh, performed experiments varying the frequency from 10 to 100,000 hertz and compare these uh, experiments with the convention, conventional heating. And here we saw something different. As we can see here, the frequency of 10 hertz, the lowest frequency we used, promoted a greater degradation of vitamin C. And we uh, believe that this, highest, high, this higher degradation is uh, due to the electrochemical reactions, because these electrochemical reactions, electrode corrosion and 
water electrolysis, they are intensified when we use low frequencies. So here we concluded that low frequencies favor electrochemical reactions and uh, increased vitamin C degradation. We performed experiments to evaluate carotenoids. Uh, in this table, we can see carotenoid degradation under ohmic and conventional heating. And again, the heating method did not influence the degradation. We had no degradation during conventional heating and a very low degradation during ohmic heating, no statistical differences. Um, so carotenoids were not in, impacted by the ohmic technology. And here I, I, I brought uh, the last study we have performed with phenolic compounds. So we evaluated the phenolic compound stability uh, in sugarcane juice during ohmic and conventional heating. We have here in the in your uh, left, your left, right, the chromatogram that we obtained. We could identify most of these compounds. And here in the right, there is um, a picture showing these phenolic compounds divided by classes, the lignols, phenolic acids, and flavones. And what we see here is that ohmic and conventional hearing show it the same pattern. They both um, promoted the same um, kind of stability in this compound. So we have the same stability under ohmic and conventional heating. And again, we concluded that ohmic heating, uh, the effects, the non-thermal effects of ohmic heating uh, did not uh, compromise uh, their stability. So after several uh, research projects, after several studies, we uh, can say that uh, uh, electrochemical reactions may impact bio, bio, uh, bioactive compounds stability, but they can be avoided by using high frequencies up, uh, up to uh, higher than 60 hertz is enough, and using inert materials for electrode manufacturing. And the polarization phenomenon does not affect the deg degradation kinetics. So, uh, after this whole of experiments, like a lot of people, a lot of scientists working to identify these non-thermal effects, uh, we have a new definition. We have the MIF processing. MIF means moderate electric field, campo elétrico moderado in Portuguese. So when we want to use the ohmic heating technology uh, focusing on the non-thermal effects of the electricity on and or in, or in the combined effects of both, uh, or the combined effects né, of electrical and thermical, we call this um, technology MIF, okay? So MIF involves the application of electric fields below 1,000 volts per centimeter with or without heating to accomplish specific object objectives. So when we are more interested in the thermal effects of the technology we call ohmic heating, such as in pasteurization, sterilization, and towing. When we need the thermal effect and the thermal effect is more important. When we are more interested in the non-thermal effects, then we call moderate electric field, such as in extraction, fermentation, enzyme activity, or drying. So now I'm going to show you some studies that we perform to evaluate the application of moderate electric field to a different, um, uh, for specific objectives. So, for example, in this study, we um, evaluated carotenoid in lipid extraction from heterochlorella luteoviridis using MIF and ethanol. So, here we have a picture, a contour line of the results. We can see combination and voltage applied we um, we was we were able to to get extracts uh, with 73 percent of carotenoid extraction using this combination of uh, 180 volts and 70 percent of ethanol solution 
And it's important to point out here that only the presence of ethanol in the highest concentration was not sufficient for carotenoid extraction. So in this case, we probably have an effect, a combined effect of both variables that modified the chloroplast's membrane structure, allowing carotenoids to be extracted. And this effect is due to the electroporation, the non-thermal effects of the electricity. This is another study where we applied MIF, um, in this case, to evaluate the effect of this technology and also ultrasound on functional properties of biodegradable gelatin-based films. So we used uh, gelatin residues from the pharmaceutical industry. We applied ultrasound and ohmic heating in the film forming solution. And then we uh, developed films using the casting method. And then here we have the main results. Um, one, result, one result that is not shown here is that uh, ohmic heating provided the films with higher mechanical properties. So we have um, tensile strength and Younglus modulus both increased with the application of ohmic heating. Uh, here we have also a picture of the, the films. Uh, ultrasound and MIF promoted a more ordered structure, higher crystallinity index and higher thermal stability. And uh, we could see also that the uh, ultrasound decreased opacity, resulting in more transparent films. And here we have um, the microscopies of the, the films, and uh, we can see, again, the effect of the ultrasound that produced a more homogeneous and smoother surface with a reduction in the size and, and number of dots. So in this case, both technologies changed the properties of the film, but the ultrasound uh, showed, um, showed more promising results to be applied uh, for this application. And in this uh, other study, the last one that I would like to show, we evaluated the influence of MIF, the moderate electric field, on osmotic dehydration of apples. So we um, conducted experiments with uh, cubes of apples and you, we modeled water loss and solid gain and calculated the, the um, mass diffusivities, right, of uh, the water and the solid. And what we could see here is uh, a, a, a picture that shows the water loss and the solid gain for all experiments. So we have experiments being performed conventionally without MIF and some with the presence of the electric field. So overall, the results indicated that the application of MIF favors the lo loss of water. We have, more, we have a, a increasing rate of water loss and also increase the incorporation of solids in the samples, showing that um, these electroporation effects are present and uh, uh, favor diffusion between uh, the tissue, right? Uh, water removal or solid gain. So uh, I would like to finish this talk with some considerations. Uh, we have this debate about uh, the non-thermal effects, if they exist or not. So several, several works have been reported results and conclusions regarding the non-thermal effects, but we have to take care because many studies, they are conducted without uh, matching the, temp the temperature profile of the two treatments. And then we don't know if these uh, effects are due to the non-thermal effects or due to a different temperature profile between samples. Moreover, um, some uh, studies, they don't uh, show a detailed methodology description or a, they, they have inappropriate monitoring and control of processing parameters. So we don't have, we are not sure if they are actually measuring the non-thermal effects. 
So the use of well-controlled systems and an accurate assessment of experimental data are essential to get reliable conclusions on the existence and the extent of these non-thermal effects. And another, th another thing that's very important is that the non-thermal effects uh, are different. They have different impacts on different microorganisms and target microorganisms. So these non-thermal non effects may be more um, pronounced in, ve in vegetative cells than in spores. Some enzymes show more resistance or, or are more affected. And uh, each microorganism, each enzyme in a specific medium, in a specific food should be evaluated uh, to avoid compromising quality and safety, to, to, be, to, to have um, a clear uh, picture of the extension of the non-thermal effects. And I end this, this talk. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm open for questions. <laughs> I cannot see you, so maybe, uh, maybe Andre, you can help me if somebody has a question. I will go back to my, maybe I, I stop sharing. O André me comentou que tem um delay. Todo mundo me ouvindo? Ok. Estou <risos> recebendo as mensagens do André aqui. Okay, Andrea is gonna write the question. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us or show us some illustration or real application on the food industry? Sure. Uh, omic heating, um, it's, a, it's used in, in the industry, industry, right? Especially for uh, particulate food systems. So system that has particles, for example, um, uh, um, like I said, a uh, uh, a uh, fruit pulp with pieces on it, uh, baby foods that has pieces on pieces of fruit or vegetables on it, soups. Uh, it's uh, it's used for example uh, soups that has meat uh, has vegetables, and there is a liquid phase. So the omic heating technology is especially good for this kind of product. It's with, it's with these products that we have that advantages that I talked about, right? So there is, uh, in the industry, there is some companies that use omic heating to pasteurize and esterilize, esterilize this kind of product. These are the both main applications of omic heating in the industry. The others that I showed in the presentation are still under uh, investigation and I, I 
I don't know any industrial uh, in industry that has me, has been used, but for pasteurization and sterilization of this kind of product is is used in a large scale. Are there experimental evidences that electric fields affect the way that the secondary structure of enzymes arrange? Um, not yet, Wagner. <laughs> uh, what I know it's about the effect of the ter tertiary and the quaternary structure, um, the effect of um, changing the three-dimensional rearrangement but not uh, really uh, in, in the secondary structure. It's a challenge to, to, to uh, how can I say, to, to show this kind of uh, effect, right? Uh, I, I couldn't see yet in the literature. More questions? No? Ah, there are, uh, no, it's a mess. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm very happy and it was a pleasure to be here and talk about a little bit about the research I've been conducting. <laughs>